Okay, we start recording. Yeah, next week, I believe it's going to be a November 8, I will be in Oklahoma City doing a talk at OU Health Sciences Center. So we won't be having a Zoom session next week on Wednesday. I may make it a different day, but it won't be on Wednesday. I'll send everybody an email and let you know, okay, as to what's, what's what. Maybe if we get further, far enough ahead, who cares? We won't even have a Zoom session. Maybe we're good. So we'll, we'll, I'll, we'll play it by ear, see how she goes. All right, so what can I lie to you about today? Oh, psychoacoustics. We did that last week. This is the continuation, psychoacoustics two, continuing in unit four. And I believe last week we talked about all kinds of things, bias. I think we contrasted two different kinds of people, Herb and Mrs. McGillicuddy. We talked about false positives, false negatives, true positives, true negatives, and I'll just kind of share a screen and show some of the slides that we covered last week. And then that way, okay, let's shrink this puppy over here. Let's enlarge the PowerPoint here. Yeah, here we go. I think we talked like this last week. We said, uh, get that black bar out of the way on top of the screen there, go away thing. Okay, I think last week we talked about people's responses to tones. We said if you heard, a, if we had 100 trials, and in 50% of the, tr the trials, the tone was present, and 50% of the time, the tone was absent. And let's say you could hear all the way down to zero decibels. So you had really good hearing. And the tone was always kept at, look at my cursor, 50. Well, every time the tone was present, you'd say, yep, you'd have a true positive. And every time the tone was absent, you'd say, nope, I didn't hear it. True negative. But we said if we made the tone five decibels, now it's soft, then you would have a harder time. Your confidence would go down. Sometimes when the tone was present, you'd say yes. Although sometimes when the tone was absent, you'd say yes, and <clears throat> false positive. Sometimes when the tone would be absent, you'd say no. But sometimes when the tone was absent, when the tone was present, I'd say, you'd say no as well, thinking you didn't hear it. And we said, then the task is very difficult when you're down to your true hearing ability. That's called your threshold. TH, the letter theta, a circle with a line going through it. Threshold. So, now you can talk, nah, 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 nah. Yeah, I could talk about these, ah, that kind of gets boring, ah, we won't go there. Okay, anyway, basically, when the tone is easy, when the, when the task is easy, you have no mistakes. When the task gets difficult, you got a lot of mistakes. And that, we said, is where bias comes into the picture. When the task gets difficult, the devil sneaks in through the back door. And that's when all kinds of stuff comes in and screws it up. So let's just take a look at what we meant by that on our notes, okay? What are we talking about here? We're talking bias. So every time you're trying to hear something, we said you're listening for a signal in noise. The signal is the tone. The noise, you can put it in quotes, is the crap that interferes. Doesn't just have to be background noise. It's the crap that comes in. The bottom part here is describing what we talked about, true positives, true negatives, false positives, false negatives. But when the tone, when stuff gets difficult, we make lots of mistakes, you get lots of false positives, lots of false negatives, and here is where bias comes into the picture. And we said last week, bias is the difference between what you can hear and what you say you hear. That's when you can get two kinds of people. That's when we talked about Herb and Mrs. McGillicuddy. Herb, the farmer who doesn't want to be there. Herb, the macho man that doesn't want to make mistakes. He doesn't want to raise his hand when he's not sure. He's going to wait to be sure he hears the tone before he raises a hand. If his hearing loss is 50 decibels, he's going to wait till the, hear, till the tone is 60 before he raises his hand. He wants to be sure. 
And on the other hand, you could have Mrs. McGillicuddy, the kindergarten teacher, the retired kindergarten teacher with her white gloves, sitting there with her legs crossed. She used to give tests all the time to children. She's eager beaver. She wants to pass. She's raising her hand like a Las Vegas gambler. She's not even, you're, you can go like this. I didn't even touch the button and you're raising your hand. It's like she's gonna lean toward false positives. Herb's gonna lean toward false negatives. And this is where the art of our field comes in. You've gotta take those two opposites and pull them to the middle. And that's where your experience as a clinician comes into the picture here. A client leaning toward false positives, a client leaning toward false negatives. You can have other types of noise that can enter a picture too, okay? It doesn't just have to be subject bias. We talked about Herb and Mrs. McGillicuddy, that's subject bias. You can have examiner bias. We've all rented cars, and when you don't know how to drive the car, you're a little bit not used to where the switches are, okay? That's the crap that can interfere. Instructions. Okay, what kind of instructions did you give? Did you just say raise your hand when you hear the tone? Or did you say raise your hand when you hear the tone even if the tones are very soft or faint, still raise your hand because we wanna find out the softest that you can hear. Okay, which type of instruction is gonna give you the best hearing thresholds? Clear instructions. What's another piece of noise in quotes? Language barrier. Okay, the mother's Chinese and you're talking to the daughter and she's got to change, she's got to translate for the, for the mother. You lose something in the translation all the time. And then now finally you can get down to other factors that can affect the outcome. Environment, background noise. Okay, now we're talking actual physical noise that can interfere. Equipment that's not calibrated properly all kinds of stuff, okay? Now, we also said last week that the type of threshold we do in our clinic is called absolute threshold because we're trying to detect the presence versus the absence of a tone. That's what we do as HISs, okay? Researchers are looking at something different. Researchers look at differential threshold. Make sure we have the distinction correctly here. Differential threshold means you already hear the sound. What's the smallest change you need to make in order for you to notice that there's a change? For example, if I play a 1000 hertz tone and I make it 1001 hertz tone, could you hear a change? Probably not. If I play a 1,000 hertz tone and then play a 1,002 hertz tone, were you able to detect that there was a change in the frequency? How big of a change in frequency did I need to make for you to notice that there was a change in frequency? And you can do that, that differential threshold stuff along three dimensions, frequency, intensity, and time. In other words, you can keep the frequency constant and present it at 50 dB SPL, and then you can present it at 51 dB SPL. Were you able to detect a difference? How big of a change in intensity did I need to make for you to notice that there was a change in intensity? That's mostly research. But the one part of here that does play a part for us is number two here, delta F. Because with sensory neural hearing loss, which is the most common cause of hearing loss in the world, with sensory neural hearing loss, they need bigger changes in frequency for them to notice changes. In other words, they cannot, and when we talked in anatomy class in 120 about the physiology of the traveling wave inside the cochlea, and we said that outer hair cells sharpen that wave. Well, when you've lost outer hair cells, your traveling waves are no longer sharp. You can't distinguish between frequencies close together anymore. You need, your comb doesn't have 100 teeth. Your comb has only 50 teeth now. Think of keys on a piano. Instead of having 88 keys, now your keyboard is just as wide, but you've doubled the keys together. Now you only have 44 keys, 44 different notes. 
Okay, they need they're, 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 they've lost that frequency resolution. The ability to distinguish between frequencies close together is diminished. Delta F is worse. Okay, anyway, that's enough on that. Absolute threshold is what we test for. And then we said, how do we test for it? We use the method of limits. So here we go, the method of limits to be distinguished from other methods. We use this guy. And we said method of limits is when you, the clinician, adjusts the tone and the client responds by pushing a button or raising a hand. That's part of the method of limits. And the other part of the method of limits is you adjust the tone in fixed increments. We don't test at 43 dB. We test at 40 or 45 or 50 or 55. We test in increments of five. We said you can use the method of limits in a descending way. In other words, starting with a tone that's clearly audible and then going down, down, down until the guy doesn't hear it anymore and call that threshold. Or we can start at zero and ascend, go up, up, up until the client does hear it. We said you can test that way too in the method of limits. But we said that the way we test is a combination of the ascending, descending methods. We said we present a tone, say, at 70. The guy hears it. You go down in steps of 10. You go down to 60. Did he hear it? Yep. You go down to 50. Did he hear it? Nope. Go up by 5 at to 55. Did he hear it? Yep. Go down by 10 to 45. Did he hear it? No. Up by 5 to 50. Did he hear it? No. Up by 5 to 55. Did he hear it? Yup. That's threshold. 2, ascending, yup, at the same dB level. Hewson, Westlake, ascending, descending approach to the method of limits. And what are we looking for? Absolute threshold. That's what we do, and that summarizes where we came last week, what we covered last time. All right, now it's time for a new set of lies, okay? Now we're going to talk about minimal audible field and minimal audible pressure. All right, big events in the lives of little men. Here we go. Okay, skip this slide. It's boring. Skip this one. It's boring. Whoops, 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 whoops. Okay. Now, take a look at this weird slide here. Now, this <clears throat> slide talks about frequency. And look at what the vertical axis is telling you. How much the eardrum wiggled. Okay, just that's all you need to know. How much the eardrum wiggled. And what they were testing was threshold across the frequencies. And you can see a line going down like this. Well, they found that the bottom here, between 2, 000, about 1,000 hertz to about five or 6,000 hertz, that was the sweet spot of our hearing. In other words, at the level of threshold, the level at which the person could just barely hear it, the eardrum moved the width of a hydrogen atom. Now that's small. Read what it says here. The circles show the amplitude of vibration of the eardrum at threshold, okay, as determined by a guy who lived in a van down by the river named Wilska. Anyway, the curve represents the calculated amplitude of air molecules in a sound wave at threshold, where the ear is most sensitive between 1,000 and 5. The eardrum vibration was less than the diameter of a hydrogen molecule. Yikes. Okay, not very much. Now, let's go to the next slide because you're going to see a curve again. A bunch of curves. Look at this. Look at these curves. Similar in shape. Okay, what are these curves talking about? Pressure in dynes per centimeter squared against the eardrum. And we're talking about how, how 
look at how you've got that curve again. All these different researchers in different labs across the country played around with this and they found out too, these curves, threshold was different across the frequencies. Okay, the pressure against your eardrum required to just barely hear a tone was different across the frequencies. In other words, we have better hearing at some frequencies than at other frequencies. And the bottom of the curve shows the better hearing and where they go up shows the hearing is worse. Now let's look at the next slide. It's got three curves on it. Ignore the top two. Ignore the top one, ignore the middle one. We're not going to talk about them today at all. We're focusing on the bottom. And that's called minimal audible field. Now, what had we said before your midterm exam? What do we call zero dBSPL? We called it the softest it takes for a normal hearing human to hear a 1,000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. Okay, Halloween, gotta like it, okay? I wore these last night when I was handing out candy to kids. I said, I'm an audiologist. Your ears get very large when you study this field. Anyway, look at the bottom curve. Zero dBSPL is the softest it takes to hear a 1,000 hertz tone at one meter distance with two ears. Cool, okay, 1,000 hertz is zero dBSPL. Fine, we established that before our midterm, okay? But now let's play that same game with other frequencies. Let's try 500 hertz, not 1,000. Let's go to 500, 500 hertz. We require more than 0 dB SPL to just barely hear. We require probably about, I don't know, 5, something like that. If you draw the line from right where my cursor is and go left, you're not quite at 10. Okay, something about seven, I don't know, something like that. Let's try the same game at 100 hertz. How much dBSPL is required to just barely hear a 100 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears? Well, do, 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 40. We require 40 decibels SPL to just barely hear a 100 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. Okay, that being the case, we can see that our hearing is not even Steven across the frequencies. And if we go to, look at this, try 2000 hertz. Let's go to, from 1000 hertz, let's jump to two. At 2000 hertz, we require less than zero dBSPL to just barely hear the tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. Okay, less. So remember we said before our midterm, does zero SPL mean the absence of sound? No, it's just the softest and a normal hearing human can hear a 1000 Hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. And we decided to call that zero. That's our ground. Okay, that being our ground, our holy place, everything else is related to that ground. Okay, everything else is related to it. So all other dBSPLs we said are absolute values, right? We said that before our midterm too. A machine making 85 dBSPL, and then another different machine making 85 dBSPL. Add them together. Is it 85 and 85? Uh-uh, it's 88. Okay, because the machines are different and we're all talking logarithms here. So, do, 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 Okay, all decibel levels are related to that zero. Well, 2,000 hertz. Let's try the game with 2,000 hertz. What's the softest a 2,000 hertz tone needed to be for a normal hearing human to hear it at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears? And it is minus, I don't know, two or three dB. Let's try 4,000 hertz. Look at 4,000 hertz right here. We require almost minus 10. Look at that. Just about minus 10. Okay? And then when we go to higher frequencies, oh, our hearing gets poorer again. It's not quite as good. 
So we've got very uneven hearing across the frequencies. And this brings us to the question of boom boxes, ghetto blasters. Okay, ever seen those boxes? They almost always have a loudness switch on them, a bass boost button. You ever notice that? You ever notice that equalizers on these guys' stereos are always shaped like a smile? The little buttons that you'll see on equalizers, they're almost always like a smile. And the reason why is because we don't naturally hear those low frequencies as well as the ones between 1 and 4,000 hertz. We need a bass boost. Okay? So this is why, and I'll bring you back to it again, share screen. This is why ghetto blasters often have that bass boost. If you look at my cursor, they need to boost up the lows. But watch this. When we crank up the volume on the stereo, you no longer need the bass boost anymore. If you crank it up to 40, hey, the smile becomes less curved. And if you crank it way up to 120, the lines flatten out. Okay, we hear all frequencies equally loud then. But when we turn down the volume, we need more bass to hear it. So let's look at this bottom line, M-A-F, minimal audible field. And what does it represent? The softest it takes for a normal hearing human to hear all the different frequencies at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. Okay, instead of just talking about 1000 hertz, we are now playing that game with all the different frequencies. And we find very uneven hearing sensitivity across the frequencies. And, as, and how loud is each frequency? Talk 50, 100, 250, 500 hertz, 1,000. How loud are each of these heard along the MAF curve? They are all heard equally loud. How loud is that? Just barely audible. That's how loud. You're at threshold. Minimal audible field is normal hearing thresholds for all the different frequencies at one meter distance from a speaker listening with two ears. M A F. It helps to explain. Now you can go to a stereo store and tell the, or ask the guy behind the counter, how come equalizer buttons are all shaped like a smile? And listen to what the person tells you. They'll probably <laughs> play a game tonight. Head out to the store and quiz them, see if they know. Okay? Now, we don't test hearing with both ears. We test hearing with one ear at a time. Okay, some ears are little, some are larger, but nonetheless, right ear, and then left ear, just like you look your vision, test one eye at a time. Okay, say the old joke from Cheech and Chung, cigarette old man, how about the other eye? Yeah, nasty. Anyway, oh, oh, oh. Um, here he goes. <coughs> So you test vision one eye at a time. Well, you test hearing one ear, one ear at a time. So MAF, we can't really play that one. So let's talk about the next one. It's MAP. MAP is this. We'll touch screen here. Go ahead. Here's MAP. Now, MAP is this game. We're testing hear normal hearing sensitivity but not one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. Uh-uh. We're testing normal hearing sensitivity across the frequencies with one ear under a headphone. One ear under a headphone. Right ear under a headphone. Left ear under a headphone. One ear under a headphone. Now, two ears are better than one. So look at MAF. Look at the curve. See how it dips below zero? When you look at MAP, there's two things you're going to notice. MAP, the whole curve went up, but secondly, it lost its big tail out here. Look where my cursor is. All that's gone. Okay, MAF, yep, MAP gone. You know why? Because we don't test below 125 hertz 
on an audiometer. Remember we said last week, we test at seven octave frequencies. 1,000 hertz, 2,000 hertz, four, eight, and then we go to 125, 250, 500, and then we test 1,000 again to make sure we got the same result we did the first time. So we test hearing at seven different octave frequencies. So MAP doesn't really care about frequencies below 125. Now, why this MAP goes beyond 10,000 is beyond me. I don't know why the authors of the book did that. I really don't know. It should end at 8,000 hertz because that's where we test hearing. But forget about that. Notice once again a curve. This curve is reminiscent all the way through. Watch MAF -MA on the bottom. These guys, these guys, okay, if you're looking at amplitude of eardrum vibration, looking at dynes per centimeter squared against the drum, looking at dBSPL, all of them show the same pattern, that curve that's mostly elevated in the lows, dips down between one and four or 5,000 hertz, and then rises again in the highs. Okay, so minimal audible field, the softest it takes to hear all the different frequencies at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears, minimal audible pressure, the softest it takes to hear all the different frequencies with one ear under a headphone. Okay, hold the concepts in your head. Look where the bottom touches here, only at zero. 1,000 hertz now is at about almost 10. 500 hertz is at about 17 or 18. 125 hertz is at 40. Okay, so everything is different here. 125 hertz here was at about 30, 35. Okay, so how much is MAP elevated? MAP is elevated by about 5 dB. It went up by about 5, about. Some more at some frequencies, a little bit less at other frequencies, but basically about 5. And what does that tell us in plain English? Two ears are better than one. And how much better? About 5 dB better. Now they call that binaural summation. Binaural summation. I can tell it to you this way. Let's say Ariana comes into the shop for a hearing test. Her right ear threshold is 10 dB. Her left ear threshold is 10 dB. Binaurally, her threshold will be 5. Okay? Two ears are 5 dB better than one. So never think that a one-eared person has a 50% hearing loss because the person doesn't. The person has about a 5% hearing loss. Okay? Two ears are about 5 dB better than one at detecting the absolute threshold. The main problem someone has who's deaf in one ear is he or she can't tell the direction of sound. That's their main problem. They have no idea of the direction. Just like you have, we have two eyes to see depth. Okay? With one eye, you see as flat as a postcard. But with one eye, it doesn't mean you have a 50% vision loss. Okay? It just means you don't see, have depth perception. Two ears, you can't tell direction of sound. So, anyway, MAP, MAF, isn't it all special? Now we need to make it even more better. So let's carry on from here. Look at the audiogram. Here's an audiogram. I'm going to get that stupid black bar out of the way. Go away. Thank you. Okay. Look at the audiogram. Frequency in hertz. And look at the numbers. Oh, shit, that thing. 125, 250. 500, 1,000, 2, 4, and 8. Look at the decibels going down. The audiogram truly should be called O-D-D-I-O-G-R-A-M, the odd, the weirdiogram, because the numbers increase going down unlike any other graph in science. Oh, no, ours has to go down. Great. There's a story behind that, but I won't go there right now. Anyway, but this is how we do it in our field. The top means no hearing loss. The bottom means big hearing loss. So, 
Look at the flat line. This flat line is zero decibels HL, hearing level. Now, what does that zero flat line really represent? Look closely. It represents minimal audible pressure. MAP is capital letters, bold-faced, underline, italics, highlight, flashing lights, is 0 dB HL. Okay? 0 dB. I even drew it on here. 0 dB HL. If you look at this flat line right here, that actually represents very different sound pressures across the frequencies. Okay, extremely important to underline and highlight this. This is why audiometers are calibrated every year. So that a thousand hertz, we might call zero up here, but in all reality, that's about 10 dB SPL. And 2000 hertz is actually about zero dB SPL. 500 hertz is actually about 12 or 15 dB SPL. 200, 125 hertz is actually about 40, read it, 40 dB SPL. Look at the line here, 40. I'm not lying, okay? So, but we don't want to call this normal and do hearing tests on this, like this, because you've got different numbers across the frequencies. I mean, look at all the different decibels from 40 all the way down to zero. You've got very different hearing sensitivity across the frequencies. And we don't feel like dealing with these different frequencies. What we do is we build in those differences into your audiometer, into the equipment that tests your hearing. And those differences are built in. And with that having been said, now zero is normal. But that zero flat line really is this, okay? And it's very important. If you hear me kind of repeating like this, count on it. It's on the final. I mean, this is, you have to understand the relationship between zero dB SPL, 0, 0, 0, 0002 dynes per centimeter squared, what that zero represents, and then what MAF represents, what does MAP represent and how do we get to 0 dB HL. So now you have two decibel references. One's SPL and the other one's hearing level. Okay? The dB SPL is the, is the ground of all grounds. I mean, that's the main one for the world, for all equipment. And then dB HL is for the human race. It's for us. Because we're not cats, we're not dogs, we're humans, and our hearing is human hearing. So the reason we've got the curves, the reason you have MAF and MAP is due to the resonances of your outer ear and the resonances of your middle ear. What's the resonance of your middle ear ossicles? 2,000 hertz. What's the resonance of the outer ear canal? somewhere between 1,500 and 4,000 hertz. Oh, how much does it give you? All oh, about 20 to 25 dB. Okay, all of that stuff, you put it together, and that's where anatomy gets married to physics, and that's what gives birth to psychoacoustics, human hearing. So you've got dBSPL as the ground of all grounds, dBHL is the ground for human race in terms of hearing sensitivity. So now we got that squared away. That's one set of lies. Let's tell you another one. All right. So you got the audiogram here. Let's see if we can advance. There we go. So here you have what I just said. Go away, little black thing. Go away. Okay. The resonances of the outer and middle ears together create an equal loudness curve that shows our best hearing sensitivity is between 1,000 hertz to 4,000 hertz. Outer ear canal resonance in red, middle ear resonances in blue, and the peak is over here, not really above 2,000 because you also, you also have a couple other resonances in the middle ear space, 
one at 900 hertz and another one at 1100 hertz or whatever. But this is the whole total outer or middle ear resonance. So you take outer ear canal resonance plus middle ear canal or middle ear resonance equals this. And look at how MAF goes down and MAP has a little bubble. You know why? Because when you plug up an ear canal with a headphone, you've lost that love and feeling. You have lost the outer ear canal resonance. You've plugged it. Remember we've said the outer ear is a quarter wave resonator. It's going to resonate with sound waves that are four times their length. So it's two and a half centimeters long. It's going to resonate with sound waves that are 10 centimeters long because 10 is 2.5 times 4. And if you figure out the frequency is speed of sound over the wavelength, you'll go speed of sound is 340 meters per second divided by 0.1 meters or 10 centimeters. 340 divided by 0.1 is 3,400 hertz. But our ear canals are not cups. Our ear canals are not made of glass or steel. Our ear canals are made of flesh and bone. And so that particular resonance gets smeared a bit and is shown over here in red. When you plug up an ear with a headphone and are looking at minimal audible pressure, you've lost a lot of that resonance, and that's why you have a bit of a bubble there. Otherwise, don't worry about it. The important point is that we have uneven hearing sensitivity across the frequencies. And the, the difference is mostly seen for the lows, which explains why we have bass boost or loudness switches on our ghetto blasters. Okay? And it also explains that the ear is made for speech because the high frequency consonants are the softest sounds in speech. And the resonances of our ears favor hearing sensitivity for those higher frequencies. And that is seen in both MAF and MAP. So it's just taking that story home. It's important to realize it. Now that slide's boring. That one's boring. That one's boring. And that one's kind of boring. That one's kind of weird. Basically, when we looked at anatomy and we looked at 120, which we will be doing in about an hour and a half from now, we're going to be looking at the traveling wave of the cochlea and how it's sharpened. And it's that sharpening of the traveling wave that improves our ability to distinguish among frequencies close together. Anyway, let's go into our, let's, uh, let's get out of here and look at our notes and see what we covered. Let's follow this in our notes now. Work on down. MAP at the top. All explained. Here you go. This is 0 D B H L. Okay? Thresholds with subject listening under headphones with one ear at a time. Clinical audiometry. Don't worry about the exact numbers. I don't even know them. Okay? Who cares? You just need to know the basic concept that we have uneven hearing sensitivity across the frequencies. And I said note the bubble on MAP between 1500 and 3000 hertz. That's because external auditory meatus ear canal resonance is gone with a headphone stuck in your ear. Okay. Uh, let's see. Here's something called temporal integration. Put a little star by that puppy there. That relates to audiometry. And it says you can't just present a tone for a split second. You have to hold the bar down for at least a second. And give the person's nervous system time to grab the whole sensation. Okay? It's called temporal integration. Temporal summation. In general, it says about two to 300 milliseconds. About a third to a fourth of a second is required for, for best behavioral thresholds. Longer is good because it helps Mrs. McGillicuddy here, okay? Beyond these lengths of time, there's not much threshold improvement, of course. And that was shown in this picture here. Not that one, not here, this one. Let's say your threshold is really zero. If I present the tone for two milliseconds, I mean, we're talking soft. If I grab this bar here and I draw it right here, 
and I'm going to paint it in PowerPoint. I'm going to make it, let's see, what can I make that outline here? I'm going to make it black, and I'm going to make it really thick so you can see it just as clearly as ever. Okay, so let's say I present the tone for two milliseconds. Your threshold is going to be about 20 dB. If I present the tone for 20 milliseconds, your threshold is going to be, uh oh, grab that line again. Where the Sam Hill is that line? Oh, I lost it in here. Shoot. I had it for a second. Okay, your threshold is going to be around 10. Right here. Okay. When I present the tone for, whoa, don't move the whole dang picture, Ted. If I present the tone for 200 milliseconds, now your threshold is down to zero. Okay, only then is your threshold all the way down to zero. So that's all temporal integration means is be nice, play the tone longer than did. Okay, that's all I mean there. Next, three different dB references. We have three of them. Here's where we will wind to and finish today. Okay, so look at three different DB references. The first one we covered long ago, DBSPL, physical sound intensity, 0 0.0002 dynes per centimeter squared. Recall, that's the softest pressure required to hear a 1,000 hertz tone at one meter distance from a speaker with two ears. The hearing aids and machines are all measured in DBSPL. Humans, number two. Second reference, DBHL. Zero dB on an audiogram. The flat line at the top shows zero dBHL. Corresponds to minimal audible pressure. No longer need to factor in different dBs of SPL for each frequency. The differences are understood and write this beyond the word understood and are built into your audiometer. They are built in. Okay, so zero on the dial is actually very different SPL. So at a thousand hertz, zero on the dial is say seven. At 2000 hertz, zero on the dial is really about minus two. At zero dBSPL, 4,000 hertz is really about minus 10. Okay, this, this is the stuff we need to keep a grip on. At 125 hertz, even though it says zero on the dial, is really about 40 decibels SPL. Okay, that's the thing we need to underline here. Okay, dBHL can be interpreted as decibels of hearing loss or decibels hearing level. Okay, so zero dBHL can mean zero decibels of hearing loss or zero dB hearing level. Normal adult hearing is 25 dB HL for all frequencies. Let's look at normal hearing. Normal human hearing, 25 or less, okay? Normal he hearing for a human being is 25 decibels or less, HL. For a child, Normal hearing is 15 decibels or less. And there's a reason for the difference. Children have not acquired all of language yet. Children can't fill in quite as easily because they haven't mastered all the vocabulary of English yet or whatever language they speak. So the educationally significant hearing loss, the bar is set at 15 for children, and the bar is set at 25 for adults, okay? A mild hearing loss is between 25 and 40. Jot it down. Mild is between 25 and 40. A moderate is between 40 and 60. Moderately dash severe is 60 to 80. Severe is 80 to 90. And profound is 90 plus. So yeah, normal, mild, moderate, moderately severe, severe, Profound. Okay, those are degrees of hearing loss 
on an audiogram. And really, that only tells part of the story, of course. And I think we said this near the end of last week, too. When we test hearing with right ear and then left ear under headphones, we called that air conduction, didn't we? Okay? Air conduction is what was your hearing sensitivity under a headphone? And the sound is traveling through the air from the headphone through the ear canal, hitting your eardrum, wiggling your middle ear ossicles, making traveling waves in your cochlea. Your hair cells are changing that into electricity and sending it to the brain. Cool. Air conduction. So air conduction might give you a hearing loss looking like, oh, we can just draw something here. Follow my cursor. Down, down, down. Good hearing in the lows. Da, 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 da. Okay? Mild to moderate sensory neural loss. That's presbycusis, the most common hearing loss in the world. When you take off the headphones, set them, hang them on the hook, then take an, a bone oscillator, like a band going around the head, put your finger behind your ear, feel the bone behind your ear, that's the mastoid bone, and you, you put the box on the mastoid bone and the headband's holding it in place and deliver the tones that way, that's called bone conduction. So back to the slide here. If your hearing shows a 50 decibel hearing loss through air conduction, and then you take off the headphones and put the bone oscillator on the mastoid bone and deliver the tones that way, maybe the hearing is zero. That means, hey man, you got a middle ear infection. You got a blockage somewhere because when I bypass your outer ear and I bypass your middle ear and I send the sound straight through the bone to your cochlea, you're hearing like a baby. Okay? But when I put it through the headphone, you've got a 50 decibel hearing loss. Hey, kids, see the doctor. You got otitis media. Okay? Air conduction was worse than bone. Now take Mrs. McGillicuddy or Herb, 75 years old. Test the person under headphones, right ear, left ear. The hearing will usually go like 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 to 70. Usually, common, common, common. Take off the headphones, hang them on a hook, put the oscillator on the bone, and guess what? The hearing doesn't get any better. It stays the same. Ah, the problem is your inner ear. Because when I bypass this and send the sound through the bone straight to your cochlea, it didn't get any better. Okay? You have sensory neural hearing loss. You need to wear hearing aids. Can't fix it. That's why we have a program at Ozarks. Okay? So those two things about the audiogram. Number one is the degree of hearing loss. And number two is the type of hearing loss. Is it conductive? That means air conduction was bad and bone conduction was normal. That's conductive. They're blocking the conduction of sound. Like electricity is conducted through a wire. Okay? If something's blocking the passage of sound, it's usually outer ear, like wax, or middle ear infection. Conductive. If it's sensory neural, the hearing is bad by air conduction and it's equally bad by bone conduction. Air conduction thresholds equal bone conduction thresholds. You've got sensory neural loss both ears. Okay, enough of that set of lies. Now let's go to the, the newest one. So I'm going to hit escape, get out of here, go back to the notes, and we'll talk about our third reference, and then we'll go home. Here we go. The third reference is called DB sensation level, SL. So look at SL. This is the level for the individual. It's the number of decibels for some frequency above someone's threshold. In English, look at the audiogram again. Whoa, where's that audiogram? Here. Let's say Teddy has a 25 dB hearing loss. So I can't hear until the tone is, follow my cursor here, 25. Okay? You're playing 1,000 hertz. And you're playing it to me at 50 decibels, 5 -oh. My ca I can't hear it till it's, till, till it's 25. You're playing the tone at 50. 
So because of my 25 decibel hearing loss, my sensation level is 25, because 50 minus 25 is 25. Now Sam comes into the clinic, and Sam's got normal hearing at 1,000 hertz. He can hear down to zero. The tone is once again played at 50. He hears that tone at a 50 decibel sensation level, because his threshold is zero. Sensation level is the difference between the tone presentation level and your threshold. So think about it like this. DBSPL is for the world. DBHL is for the human race. And DBSL is for you. Your particular thresholds are your DB reference. So you've gone from SPL to HL to SL. Sensation level is not used much in our field, a little bit. It's used a little bit in some tests, but not much. We will use it when we talk about acoustic reflex testing. Next year, when you start studying more advanced audiometry, we'll be revisiting sensation level because acoustic reflexes are measured in terms of sensation level. Otherwise, sensation level doesn't really play that much of a part. We deal with SPL for hearing aids and HL for humans. Okay, those are the two DB references we care about. You know, just before, I think before the midterm, we were talking about decibel references and absolute value and relative values and all that. I was sitting on the train the other day. Yes, I take a train. It's called the Sky Train. It's an above ground subway here in Vancouver. Hovers along about 60 miles an hour. Gets me over to the college campus in about 15 minutes. It's great. You just shove in your car, you walk up, you sit on this train, and it goes, it uses electricity, it goes on electricity. It's really cool. Anyway, I was sitting on that train, thinking about Halloween and stuff like that, and suddenly the decibel flipped into my head because I'm such a nerd. And I thought to myself, I know a way to talk about absolute and relative in a better way, I think. Think about time. Think about 4 p.m. If it's 4 p.m., is it central time? Is it mountain time? Is it Pacific time? What's, what's 4 p.m. reference to? What's the, the ground for 4 p.m.? Well, it's your time zone, and also it's Greenwich time in England. Okay, that's Greenwich central to Greenwich. That's what the, the word looks like. And it goes right through the United, through, through England. That's, the, the, that's where the, 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 the main reference time clock of the world is, okay? Greenwich time, and then you've got your, your, your time zones moving out from that. A relative time value might be like two hours. Two hours. Well, what the hell is two hours? Well, you can add two hours to 4 p.m. and now you got six. I can add two hours to 6 p.m. now I got eight. Two hours in terms of time is a relative value. 4 p.m. is an absolute value. 6 p.m. is an absolute value. I can't add 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. It doesn't make any sense. But I can add two hours to 4 p.m. Sure, now I'm at 6. I can add two hours to 6 p.m. Now I'm at 8. And that's how we, we like think about hearing aids, what we talked about. Input plus gain is output. Remember we talked about that? And gain is in dB. And input is dBSPL. It's an absolute value plus gain, which is a relative value, equals output, another absolute value. So I think about that in parallel to the way I just described time. So I'm just harking back. I don't know. It was just a nerd's thought. Anyway, it's been a slice. Told you this unit would take us a few weeks. We ain't done it yet. Next week, we're going to cover binaural hearing. Two ears. Directionality, the cocktail effect stuff like that, and then we be done this unit, moving on really well through the course. I will not be here next week, Wednesday. I'll be in the great state of Oklahoma. Anyhow, I will be there and uh, for about three or four days. No, I think just two days. Anyway, but I'll be there traveling on Wednesday and heading back on Friday. So we won't have a Zoom session at this particular time, but I'll send everybody an email and let you know when and where, or I'll put an announcement on 110. Okay? Cheers. See you later. Live long. Prosper. Do this. Because when you do this, somebody can't get you. Okay? Of course, if they do this, they can get you. Anyway, see you later. All right. Bye. All right.